On today's episode, special guest Matthew Kanker reacts to our reaction video of the Pomp and Shift debate. We're going three levels deep today, so what will come out on top, gold or crypto? Stay tuned to find out, but before we get started, be sure to bury your private keys and gold bars on the dark side of the Hoddle Hoddle moon. moon. And now, a word from today's sponsor. Hi there, Greater Fool Fallacy Crypto Fam. My name is Peter Schiff with goldmoney.com. I predicted the U.S. housing collapse, and I also predicted that Bitcoin would go to zero. My incredibly impressive 50% accuracy in predictions is exactly the same as randomly flipping a gold coin. If you'd like to use your worthless crypto to purchase gold, you can do so at goldmoney.com. Although I've said that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value and that a medium of exchange doesn't count as a use case, I inexplicably accept crypto myself as a form of payment. If you don't understand this, please hop on the intellectual balance beam and practice your mental gymnastics. If you'd like to find out more, please visit us at goldmoney.com. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right, and we're back with another episode of Dark Side of the Hollow Moon. This is going to be our first interview, and we our guest today, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, this is Matthew Kankar. I'm uh, very happy to be on your show. I'm a fan. Okay, cool. And uh, Josh is here, of course, too. And, hey, everyone. And Josh... Uh, um, Matthew wanted to um, respond and talk about um, the Pomp and uh, Peter Schiff debate and our analysis of, of the debate. So, uh, Matthew, what do you think of uh, the debate and our analysis of it? Where do you agree? Where do you disagree? Well, let's uh, uh, before we get into that, let's give Matthew more of an intro, I think. So I've met Matthew a couple of years ago. I know that he's a good guy. Um, I know that he's very smart when it comes to gold, and I respect his opinion on on that. So when he listened to our show and then he had his own thoughts, I thought, well, let's definitely try and do a show with him because we might learn some stuff. And then in addition to that, he's been uh, like following the show from day one and always commented on it. So it's good to have uh, him on the show. And also he's got his own company, which we can talk about later. Uh, so... Matthew, how about you uh, introduce yourself, what you're doing now, and what your company is about, and then we can get into the debate. How about that? Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Matt Kankar, and I'm also someone who's uh, been a Korea expat before. I, I do have my own company that does consulting and education called the Practical Education Institute, which is at practicaleducationinstitute.com. Um, I've done consulting now in five or six countries, designing curriculum. Um, I'm also a school teacher. I have a bit, uh, background in education, master's, teacher leadership, education, bachelor's. Um, but I've always had the fascination in economics, and that's where I try to self-educate myself in uh, the area relevant to this podcast. Fascinated by cryptocurrency. I am fascinated by gold, but gold more is just one component of economics in general. Yeah, and what? by the way, what do you think of the economics curriculum at most schools when it comes to teaching economics and money and finance? Do you think it, find it lacking in a lot of government schools? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I guess it's very limited. So when it comes to basic fundamentals, I think maybe the intro classes are, are fine for an introductory level, but you can see there is definitely a twist in a lot of educators towards left-leaning philosophies, even though they don't follow the economics or even teaching in the course, which is interesting enough. Yeah, I would, I would imagine, I think all three of us kind of learned a lot of what we know about economics and money through uh, self-education and discovery, self-discovery, definitely. Sure. Yeah, that's, um, that's quite a, a good point. We all have that self-education journey that we had to go on because I think we share the opinion that we haven't had the full education that you would require which we would expect really um so schools are failing and i think uh in terms of economic and business education and i think that's what your uh company is trying to help solve that bridge that gap is that right matthew yes and actually this podcast frankly fills that void which is one thing that intrigues me because you're teaching you're teaching practical skills by this very podcast so 
uh, people have to seek out their own information and uh, consider different sides of arguments. And that's why I want to be on here personally. I want to contemplate things with you more than argue, because from past experience, from your show and from experiences in the Coin Hustle Facebook group, for example, or other places, I think we have a lot of common ground to build on, but there's some variations that I want to hash out with you. And maybe I can learn something you can, and maybe the listeners can uh, give some input later as well. Okay, cool. Um, All right. So now we've done the proper intro. Now let's get back into the debate. Yeah, definitely. So Matt, why don't you tell us um, first, maybe some brief thoughts on the Peter Schiff and Pomp debate? So my first take when I was watching it, I expected I'm going to be watching this debate and I, I caught the last part of when it was actually live streaming your YouTube and then I went back and watched the first part on YouTube and I was, I was thinking, oh, these guys are going to be disappointed in the pomp side of this debate. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I don't think Peter uh, Schiff, I agree with a lot of things that you said uh, about Peter. I think he was kind of dismissive. He went back and refrained a lot of the same points. But I thought it was because mm-hmm. I never heard Pomp rebut his point, the whole debate. So I was like, he lost because he didn't address the key fundamental flaw with Bitcoin relative to gold. And I'm a cryptocurrency fan. I just think Bitcoin, as much as I love and respect its place historically and currently, I think that Peter Schiff is right about the future of Bitcoin relative to other currencies. Okay, good. And um, and you also watched our analysis of the debate. Did you have any take brief takeaways from that? Or did you learn anything from yeah. our little analysis back and forth? Um, well, I, I know you guys tend to be uh, very pro-crypto generally, and I'm very pro the technology. Uh, my, the thing I contemplate that Peter refrained on is, well, what about the actual currency placeholder on these networks, on these blockchains, that's the part there where I think there's some discrepancies between uh, maybe you and I and Peter and Pomp. I think Pomp was great. Like, I think he was a great guy in how he conducted himself. I think it's nice that he has some nuance to it. Peter is definitely very blunt. He reminds me of uh, maybe a grandfather who was just like swatting flies. He was like, no, sorry, no, sorry. Because to him, until you can address the fundamental flaw, everything you're saying is not relevant. Yeah, well, we definitely have different takeaways from the debate because, um, yeah, I didn't think Peter Schiff debated well at all. And he just kind of kept going back to the same point over and over again. And also, yeah. I don't think he really answered um, Pomp's uh, points. Uh, Josh, do you want to chime in here? Yeah, I think that um, having listened back to the show recently, a couple of days ago, um, the one that we did our reaction video. Um, what I took away from that and reflecting on that was that Peter Schiff was very good at being Peter Schiff in terms of promoting himself and promoting his uh, products and promoting his company. And he didn't really veer away from the script. And when it came to the philosophical stuff, he just said, it's the greater fool. When it came to the use case stuff, he said, but you can't spend Bitcoin in, in real life, but you can spend gold. But then there's a contradictory thing there, which I pointed out at the time, which is his uh, gold money card, which is nice. It's a novelty in a way that he pulls out a, like an actual gold MasterCard or whatever. Right. When you're spending that, you're not spending gold at the time, but you are mm-hmm. trusting a third party to transfer that ownership of gold into US dollars. And then you're sending the merchant US dollars. Now, he levied that criticism at uh, people that use Uh, Bitcoin to pay for things. So, for example, uh, the Coinbase card or BitPay card or the the umpteen cards that are coming out now, like Crypto.com card. If you spend Bitcoin, in reality, what they're doing is converting that Bitcoin into US dollars and then the merchants accepting US dollars. But he's on the one hand saying that it's fine uh, for him to do it and his company. But when Bitcoin does it, it's fake or it's not real or somehow that's uh, that doesn't count as a, a value proposition. That's where I thought that he was uh, sticking to a script too much, not being willing to actually accept reality. And um, the reality is that Bitcoin can do many of the things that gold um, has been a store of value in the past and it, it, it's it, it's useful. But Bitcoin can do it in a more efficient way. That's my opinion. So this is where we could 
go back and forth about you know how did that uh, disagreement come about but i still want to go a little bit more into your your thoughts like uh, unpack that a bit more what yeah. what, what well, you saw I, well i thought i i i agree that he was uh contradictory um matt what do you what do you take do you think he was contradictory when he made that point i think he was dismissive because he keeps on going back to this one point and this is what i wanted to address First of all, I, want to, I wanted to speak about the gold money part. Gold money, as far as I understand, I'm not sure if he's an owner uh, via cash transfer, but uh, so gold money was uh, purchasing Schiff Gold. So they have the physical gold part of Schiff's company. So I think Schiff probably ended up with like some ownership stake, stock holding in gold money when they took over Schiff Gold. So I, I'm sure he does have a stake. He is pitching gold money. I'd say granted. Now, gold money also stores cold storage trading for cryptocurrency. So he's part of even an exchange and a cold storage for cryptocurrency right there. So I can see some dilemmas there. Uh, but he would say on his own podcast, which I'm very familiar with, which helps give me some perspective on where he's coming from. He would say, I think, that he respects the technology of blockchain. And that's something that's come about in more recent times, the last year, let's say, not back in 2017. Uh, but now... Um, I think that he realizes there's technology. I can imagine even gold money trying to create a blockchain like you were discussing in the last podcast that would actually handle these gold transfers. And I think that's where the value of the blockchain comes in. And what I want you to help me understand is uh, this is where I think the crux of the debate is and where I think Peter became dismissive over and over again, which I could see would be frustrating mm -hmm. is he doesn't see the value in the actual coin or the token itself on the actual blockchain. The blockchain itself can have value. You could have products and services like a music exchange, like you said, where you're transferring a product of value over a blockchain. Or you could have a gold-backed token, like Josh introduced me to this product, actually, the DigiStyle product, where you have a blockchain called DigiStyle, and you're getting a commission for your ownership on that. And then there's Digix, Digix gold-backed tokens in a vault, much like gold money, although it happens to be in Singapore. This kind of thing, I think, is the future. Um, and I'm not saying it has to be gold. I'm, I'm someone that I think you might agree. Let the free market dictate. If there's a supply and a demand, I let it be. And if Bitcoin wins, I'm more than happy to let that win. But I, I see more value in utility tokens and gold-backed tokens. Or my thinking, my future anticipation is it will be like a stock. could be another currency. So you might have a GM blockchain, an IBM blockchain, an Apple blockchain, mm -hmm. and maybe one token represents a share of stock. So if it comes down to it, would you rather have something that has no backing when it comes to actual value of the token alone, not just the chain itself, or do you rather have something that has some further backing or functionality behind it? Yeah, well, for me, I'm not an either or kind of guy. For me, I like gold, I like silver, and I like crypto. I actually have a little Morgan silver dollar right here. And we know it has value and it always will have value. I think um, one thing where I think Bitcoin has value that maybe people don't understand is for one example, the portability, the transferability, the non-seizability, um, it can't be matched with gold. So for example, you know, in the US things are okay, but in some places there's really bad capital controls and you can't, like, for example, um, Iranians got 2.5 billion U.S. equivalent out of the country through Bitcoin. They couldn't have done that with gold. It just wouldn't have been possible. You can't put a gold bar in the plane and smuggle it out. And that's the thing with, uh, like, a crypto that's backed by gold. Well, the gold still has to be in a vault somewhere. So that creates a whole different issue. Um, and it brings up the thing with Brinks and third-party trust. With Bitcoin, there is no third-party trust. And it's unconfiscatable. So as long as you don't think it's going down to zero like Peter Schiff, it has a different use case that's above and beyond gold or any sort of asset-backed currency, in my opinion. Okay. So this is where I would come from that. I, I agree with everything you said generally. But I would say gold, like the actual physical gold pieces, if you were moving them physically from like Singapore to the United States, you do have a problem. But I'll just use myself as an example. I own quite a lot of gold uh, vary in varying locations. So I have gold in probably eight countries, nine countries. 
I own physical gold. I'm not afraid to really talk about this. So I feel open saying that I feel like my risk is very diversified. So I would ask you, where would you gather most of the cryptocurrency is kept um, currently? Um, well, I think it depends on the person. You know, for me, I have uh, I have currency, I have cryptos on my phone in like three or four different wallets, not a huge amount, maybe several hundred dollars. But then you have it maybe in a ledger. Some people have it in cold storage. Some people... Um, it's non-custodial or custodial. So maybe they put it on an exchange and you're trusting Coinbase or Binance or someone else to store it, just like you're trusting someone to store the gold. But right. um, I think me and Josh are big believers that you really want to control your private keys because if they're, it's not your keys, it's not your crypto. Josh, you want to chime in? Yes, actually, I do. What I'd like to go back to is the crux of the argument, like you mentioned. And um, Matthew, you mentioned that, you know, the, the value is in the blockchain, but it's not in the, the, the coin itself. I can see the logic of that argument in a certain sense, but I want to use uh, my marketing background to kind of demonstrate a point here. And I hope it works out. It may not. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, Matthew, and also you, Kate, can chime in. Who was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean? Uh, That's a very good question, but I'm not sure. I know Amelia Earhart was trying to fly around the world. Was that also her or no? That, that was, was my her. answer. Yeah, so, did, so you knew that. Um, Amelia Earhart did. And Matthew, is that what you had in your mind? Yes, correct. Okay, and who was the second woman? No one knows. I, I know where you're going. Um, Yes, and actually, this is what I wanted to address, and Peter so Schiff already is. This is what I want to go back to as well. It's like, um, if you look at the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, um, which is a great book, uh, something that I've read, and I think it was one of the most profound things that I got out of the book, is that the power of being first is so strong. And Bitcoin being first with its network effect is unstoppable due to that nature it has an inherent advantage by the fact that it's the first coin it might not have any technical advantage over other coins but it has the um, the mind share advantage just like facebook has the mind share advantage as being one of the first social networks to really catch on mm -hmm. um but bitcoin was definitely the first um peer-to-peer -peer cash decentralized and i i hope that that point was uh, well taken because what yeah. I mean is that that mind share that that network effect that keeps on building and building and building is Bitcoin's biggest advantage and I think that that is um, it's hard to put a dollar amount on it but it's something that cannot ever be overcome. Uh, Pampa was also mentioning this and I saw how Peter Schiff reacted and he had the same reaction as I did when you were doing this or when Pomp said it is that's fine if it's a product that's going to last, period. Um, like, like he mentioned um, other examples of things that were first that failed. And I think that has some validity to it. Like you have MySpace and now Facebook's dominating. I would argue that Facebook's going to go away. Google, Google is going to go away. It's a matter of when and how. A lot of things disappear from a different niche. Like I don't think Google necessarily more likely would lose the same market niche, but there'll be a new niche that's filled by a new product that we haven't even foreseen yet. So like internet, like people are saying, well, uh, what about the competition and wired internet? Well, I just think the parallel would be it's going to be something like cell phone service where you have towers all over the place. It's not going to be someone comes in and builds a whole new infrastructure to compete with Comcast in the United States, which has a monopoly in many places in the United States with cable internet. There'll be a different niche completely, and that whole new niche is what will reemerge. So what I think he would argue and I would argue is, that Bitcoin is a something that will never have a winner in the form it's in, period. All of them are going to go away. Yeah, but I think in a long enough time scale, you could say everything is going away, maybe with the exception of gold. But, you know, Bitcoin has been around for a while now. They've been saying it was going to be dead in 2011, 2012. It's coming up on 2020. And I always wonder... Um, 
at what point will will maybe you or Peter Schiff or other people accept that it's probably not going to go away? I'm looking at coin market cap right now, and the value of Bitcoin, the market cap is two hundred twelve billion dollars. The next one's twenty two million Ethereum, XRP, twelve billion Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin, which are related to Bitcoin at five billion. So, I mean. He's been uh, forecasting the death of Bitcoin going down to zero for a while. Um, do you think that's going to happen in the short term, medium term, super long term? Because I honestly just don't see it. This is the uh, billion dollar question. I'll tell you, I, I was thinking about this. He was mentioning some low price he could have bought Bitcoin. Uh, I think you're probably familiar that I'm very involved in the libertarian networking. I, I could have had Bitcoin at four cents easily. And I could have had it for free probably too because people are giving it away. In the Northeast, especially in New Hampshire, there was um, a big network of the free staters that were just giving it away to spread and market. Um, so I've also bought cryptocurrency. I own some Bitcoin. I own another cryptocurrency. I do own more gold. I've, all, I've already made a gentleman's bet, and I'm not sure what else I got into for this bet. I got <laughs> the check um, on gold being worth more than Bitcoin in 10 years. Oh, man. Well, I would definitely join an the side of well, an ounce of gold versus one whole bitcoin one bitcoin yep you think all right i would i would join the uh you know i i definitely take up that bet as well i think that bitcoin would would be worth more because it already is worth more and it continues to keep on growing now is it because you believe that it is the greater fool fa fallacy in play do you think that it's just more and more fools getting in or do bitcoin you think yes or do you think that there's something fundamentally, well, you've just answered the question, so I won't finish it. But, you know, the fact that you said that there were people back in the day that were trying to spread Bitcoin to you, the, like the, the really hardcore libertarians, they could see the value case in that. And they could see that you didn't need it, the, the government involved, you know. So you can I, see the value in that. Yes, I, I expected Bitcoin would have a run at some point. What I wanted to do then, and you can imagine the scenario now, it was so hard to get it at that time, you know, unless you had the paper and wrote down the numbers and I couldn't yes. get access to them. Yeah. So, so when did you hear about it? I'm like, do you have like a year? Like when did you first hear about Bitcoin? I was trying to figure this out and someone told me it wasn't even invented the year that I speculated, but it, it was at the time there was, there were people online talking about it and they were giving it away. And people were selling large volumes for four cents. I remember that because my lucky number. It stuck out to me. And I wanted to buy $100 worth, and I couldn't get it. Like, I couldn't transfer it to myself at the time. Um, so, yes. That was probably eight years ago, nine years ago, in the way beginning. Yeah, that would be the Bitcoin pizza days. Oh, yeah. it was, I, I knew about Bitcoin before the pizza thing happened because I heard about it later. Yeah, yeah so you know that there definitely um, is value in this just by the fact that people want to use it, you know? Yeah, and you, but, talk, you can't deny that there, there's some value because right now people pay money for it. I would agree with that. I just think that it's not the long-term answer. I think you're going to see something like I discussed earlier that has a further backing that uses amazing technology. Bitcoin, I love it because I think that person was likely a libertarian-minded person, and I think they had very good intention. Mm -hmm. I just think that there's going to be a better alternative that comes in and dominates. And I think actually something like Libra, even though I think it's a terrible product, where you have a big company coming in and normalizing it, that could become where the trend begins. You're going to have someone come in and push into the market. There's going to be some sort of competence in that product. And this is going to be replaced by something better. It's not that Bitcoin didn't have its place in time. It doesn't have no any value in the past present or even future. If you told me it was going to 100,000 and that in 10 years, it was worth more than gold. That wouldn't shock me by any means because timing is the hardest thing to predict of it all. Like the financial crisis, Peter Schiff got right. Ron Paul was predicting it back in 2001 and explaining how it would happen. But knowing when or if the prediction comes true is a different story. I, I thought we'd be in a recession in the United States because um, I thought Hillary was probably 60-40 at the time is what I was writing to people. I thought it was 60-40 Hillary. Most people were saying 99% Hillary. I would say <laughs> I, I said 60-40 very publicly, and I got laughed at. And the next day, it was a, an interesting, silent place. So um, uh -huh. I, I think the timing is the catch. Um, I just think that we're bound to see a better product come and replace an amazing leap forward.
Well, I can uh, sympathise with a lot of those positions, um, especially I agree with the position that you've stated, of which is Facebook's Libra coin is going to bring about a massive awareness shift. However, I think that the resulting, let's say, aftermath of Libra coin and uh, let's say the trickle down thing, the made up term trickle down, let's say the mind share trickle down is going to be back to Bitcoin, though. I don't think it's going to be, well, Libra is obviously going to be fast, it's going to work, but I don't think that Libra is then going to um, lose its market share and then it's going to go to another massive big corporation with a better product. I think that the, um, if anything, it's going to go back to Bitcoin, which is the pure version of cryptocurrency. So once this adoption of cryptocurrency happens, because people see the use in it, I think what, what you'll see inevitably is humans being humans, this uh, council of 25 to 40 uh, validator nodes that are going to be on the Libra um, platform that have all paid $10 million to play, um, they're going to conspire together in, they're going to fuck up once or twice. Probably the first time it'll be written off. Second time, a lot of people will leave and they'll seek alternatives. And I don't think an alternative can be brought about after that um, that breach of trust has happened with a corporation. They will go back to the most purest form of uh, peer-to-peer cash, which is Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin, which is uh, still not really, quote-unquote, air quotes, owned by somebody. So even Bitcoin Cash has a kind of image problem in the sense that it's perceived to be owned by uh, Roger Ver and friends, whereas Bitcoin itself has avoided that entirely. So as I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist at all, and I also sympathize with your views about the technology not being perfect, but I think because it's ideologically pure um, and the amount of disgruntled people that will come from what it is essentially um, corporations getting in on the on the heist and getting in to the game because they see it as a profit uh, profitable venture. They're going to make some poor decisions inevitably that result in a big fallout and then a, a lot of people going back to the ideologically pure Bitcoin. I agree with the idea of them going back to an ideologically pure like to an ideologically, excuse me, pardon my speaking, uh, a pure sense of having a blockchain and having uh, the verification be on a public ledger. But imagine if something like the New York Stock Exchange was put on a blockchain, or uh, if you had voting uh, starts being put on the blockchain, whether it be something like Ethereum or Ardor, um, I think you could see something where you uh, suddenly incorporate the world onto these public ledgers and those things are what are going to take off. I see the blockchain as being more like a tool that's going to emerge and not the particular currencies being a reinventing of the wheel. I think you'll see gold, you'll see commodities, you'll see stocks, you'll, you'll see things with um, a tangible value be put on the blockchain and you'll see an unstoppable force of people actually uh, getting the competition they crave. And you see things like Uber and Airbnb emerging where the technology of this move so much faster than the state, the state can't keep up, I think you'll see this, the world gradually be moved to this kind of a system, and you'll see a lot of overlap, but on a new network. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with you there, and I think that's one common point we have in common, is I do think that there'll be maybe gold-backed cryptocurrencies, um, there'll be like security tokens on the blockchain where you can buy stocks using the blockchain technology, there's other use cases with inventory tracking. Yeah, blockchain is a technology, but I think where we differ is I think uh, Bitcoin and any other ones that come to the space, Bitcoin Cash, Dash, Monero, they're going to be used in parallel with these asset-backed blockchains. I, I just don't see something without the backing that people tend to crave by human nature going away. And that reminds me of a point that was in the podcast and the debate. You were talking about um, how shift dismissed the uh, value, the transactional value of Bitcoin. And um, there is value, obviously, because people are paying for things. But the medium of exchange Bitcoin has become 
skipped a step in the history of money. And this is where he keeps on going back to. So what I think needs to come across more clearly that he didn't convey well in that debate is that the, you, there, was, there was no use for Bitcoin before it was made to be the medium of exchange. It's not really money yet because of the volatility. So we'll say medium of exchange just mm -hmm. for those uh, distinctions. So gold, people wanted that gold and they used it. He mentioned the jewelry case, and that's a, a very valid thing. Most of gold is in jewelry. It's already being used. Most gold is not money right now. Most of the gold is jewelry or electronics right now. So th there was a first use. And it became money only because of the intrinsic value. So you have something, not only jewelry, but the money, the natural aspects of it actually preserved it, you know, like because it doesn't tarnish or whatnot. That's why silver was worth less than gold. Mm -hmm. Even though I, I think silver might be more aesthetically pleasing, the functionality of gold as jewelry or electronics, if they could use gold, they would replace multiple other elements with gold if it was a cheaper asset. Yeah, I think th I think that's interesting. Um... Well, you're saying it skipped a step like it's a bad thing. You know, when I hear, I think it skipped a step, but I think it skipped a step because it's a revolution. Uh, Josh, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I mean, it was designed not to be physical. Yes. Because uh, you want to be able to, in a digital world, quickly settle things. I think that as the whole world moves online, and I think, you know, I if I go back to... First, having broadband. So broadband is a way of saying fast internet before like the dial-up stuff. I think I was one of the first kids in my school to get broadband internet. And ever since that day, you've seen a mass adoption of tech. Like we live our lives through our devices now, our laptops, phones, tablets, desktops still. And I think that Bitcoin is just a natural extension of that. We're going into a different type of world. I don't think that we're going to live in a world where you're going to have to have a, a physical, tangible touch and feel asset like gold in order to, um, to settle things as a medium of exchange. I think that gold did have its place at that time. It was better than the other available options. I think that um, gold is still, you know, nice. It's aesthetically pleasing. You can make jewelry out of it. It can be used for, like, uh, other technology, like you've mentioned. But when it comes to something that people have put trust into, and also let's not forget the computational power that's behind the the Bitcoin network, and all of the energy that's behind it, and all of the actual dollars that have been spent on that energy. Now, some of it's renewable, of course, but a good portion of it is actual um, people investing their own money into mining so that they can reap a reward. That's the, you know, that's the capitalist economy at work there. People putting their own uh, money where their mouth is and in order to support something. Now, I think what Cade mentioned is, is right. It skipped a step because we're in a different era and I don't think we're going back to the Paleolithic age or anything else where we were um, you know where we started to begin trading or anything like that I don't really uh, see us going back to that where you needed something physical and then if we even let's say for example we did let's say we did go back to that think about all of the extra effort that's required to verify the authenticity of the gold that you have in front of you. You need to be trained in order to understand if it's really gold or not. If you are not trained, and the training takes a lot of time, time equals you know money in the economy, you have to invest in that time so that you can train yourself, or you have to trust a third, a third party in order to verify that gold. Then you have to trust a third party to store the gold for you unless you want to be, uh, you know, robbed by the gang. And if you think about your own hesitancy and the way that you carefully prefaced that you have gold stored in eight different countries and it's not on your physical person, I don't think that that was an accident. That was a self-protection mechanism because you don't want people knocking on your door and saying, hey, like, Where's the loot at, mate? You know, so Bitcoin solves a lot of those problems by um, and by existing on the blockchain. Like when you said, where is the where, where is it stored? I think that that's a bit of a misunderstanding 
in terms of the question because all of the Bitcoin is stored on the blockchain. Just because someone forgot the private keys doesn't mean that the Bitcoin has stopped existing. It still exists on the blockchain. Um, if there are nodes running, then that Bitcoin still exists. Just because uh, you don't have the private keys or you've given them uh, in a custodial fashion for safekeeping or that you um, written it down on a paper wallet, your mnemonic phrase, and then you've lost it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means that you can't access it because you've made a mistake. So that's where the value about is. Government intervention in the exchanges. If they were to ha to seize the places that actually control the cold storage or the exchanges, so the exchanges are holding it in, custodi in custodialship, but the government takes custody of a good volume. Uh, so, like if they took Coinbase right now. Or, and they took gold money's cold storage right now, it would be much like if they to took the vaults that are in New York or in another city in, in Florida, for example. Yeah, yeah that's but, right. But, that's what we say. But if, you ha but if yeah, like, I mean, not your, in here. not your keys, not your crypto. You know? Yeah, if you, if you have the private keys, no one can touch it. You can literally store the Bitcoin between your ears if you just memorize your private key. Um, I kind of want to jump back a little bit because, to be honest, I used to think more like you do, Matt. Um, and actually, I was pr I heard about Bitcoin pretty early, too. I want to say it was not quite as early as you, but maybe 2012. And I also had the same reservations about, oh, it's just uh, computer code. It doesn't have any value. And I kind of slowly came around. And I think um, this is one key point we should get into is maybe or not understanding it or not seeing that it can have value without some sort of asset backing it. But I think it's also a generational thing because uh, I think there's a survey of Generation Z and most of them would rather have Bitcoin over gold or stocks. So I know it seems kind of esoteric and kind of out there. You know, how can this have value? But I think um, although it's never been money before, this can really be a revolution. And I was kind of curious you think it's going down you have this gentleman's wager um what and gold going up yeah so what chance because you know pump ended his debate saying oh if you think there's a zero per if a hundred percent chance it's going to go down don't buy any but even if there's a one percent chance it's going to go up you need to have some so for me i think it's possible but i think it's fairly unlikely that it's going to drop to zero or you know drop anywhere near that so how confident are you that you think it's going to drop eventually? The eventually, I guess the time frame is hard. Um, I, I lean towards less than 10 more years. If I had a gut feeling, I don't have a strong conviction on that. But I, I do have a feeling that there's going to be something coming in that will replace it. And it will be, what will be very intriguing is to see what happens when we have that next financial crisis. Now, a lot of young people do probably prefer Bitcoin. They also prefer Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. I, I don't I don't necessarily think that that young people thing will necessarily mean it translate to the future part of their life. It could. Um, I think that that tech is there and they like the technology innovation. That doesn't mean that they wouldn't prefer. Well, would you rather have a Bitcoin that was backed in gold that was broken up into 100 locations where one hundredth of that Bitcoin was dispersed? Or would you rather have something that is backed by uh, nothing tangible. And, and I want to focus one point on that because you made, you made a good point and, and so did Pomp on this. And I think the terminology might be a problem, not necessarily a physical asset like gold, but something that has some sort of value beyond the fact that we're saying, oh, this is a coin. There's nothing uh, beyond what the network, the blockchains have, that all blockchains could theoretically have. There's not something. So like if it was music, there could be value in the music ownership. This is another complex tangent, and it might be a future thing. One thing to consider would be intellectual property, I would argue. But um, ideas and things that can be duplicated might have a different value than things that are tangible, which include labor, like a service, for example. So a service being provided by a blockchain, even though it's not tangible like gold might be, it does have value. And even in uh, an economy that Peter Schiff might uh, be very proud of, the service has some value as well because of the human capital and, and Bitcoin does have some of that, I, I confess. Okay. I, well, I got a question I want to pose to actually both of you. A little thought experiment here because um, I don't know if you guys like Star Trek or Star Wars, but just imagine going into the future, you know, a thousand years, two thousand years. 
Um, do you think in in some sort of Star Wars type universe, they're still going to be using gold as money? Let's start with Josh, and then let's get Matt's take on it. Two thousand years, bloody hell! Um, <laughs> will they? Will gold still have value? Yes. Will gold be um, the main medium of exchange? No. Will they be We're... transporting gold on the spaceships from planet to planet? Well, unless they literally did invent that machine that they had on Star Trek where you can just kind of beam me up Scotty and transfer it through that teleport thing. Um, I don't think that they're going to be investing a lot of time like moving bits of gold around. I've heard that they are going to start trying to mine gold on asteroids and stuff in the future. But it comes down to the case of, um, all right, why have humans chosen this particular asset over others i think that gold is better than many other physical assets that's why it's won out but it has some weaknesses compared with uh, cryptocurrency now i think matthew's point is that gold is the best of all of the physical assets that are available all of the tangible assets and that bitcoin technologically isn't as strong as it could potentially be is that fair to say that that's your position, Matthew? Yeah, that's correct. I, I think it will be replaced on the technology side, but also I think there's going to be a craving to have some sort of functionality beyond the good the blockchain does for everyone. And what do you think about my uh, hypothetical question in a thousand years or two thousand years when people have spaceships possibly and, you know, it's you know, technology has advanced so much. Do you think people will still be using gold as money or do you think the blo uh, Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency will supersede it? I think in 2000 years, Bitcoin is almost surely gone. Um, but, uh, but gold will still be around. I don't think the moving of gold is going to be what's happening. I think it's going to be more keep it where it is, dispersed location, where there's going to be a reserve, just like it's been in the past. Gold was a symbol of wealth. It was like your savings account, right? So people only had it when they actually had more than enough disposable income. Now, do I think gold would be the only money? Probably not. Uh, I think that well, even in our current system, like you had government intervention promoting gold and silver in the United States. You have government intervention imposing the dollar. Could the government impose Bitcoin? Sure. And other fiat systems? Sure. I think Bitcoin still has fiat properties because not of the duplication on the network, but because you can have a parallel network that could replace it doing similar or better functionality. That, that's what I think is going to happen, actually. Uh, and that's why I don't think it's a long-term hold. Would I buy Bitcoin? Yes, because I thought it would go up, and it did, and I made a lot of money. But I sold it. Um, and I sold it in December 2017 when I thought it was going to go down, and it did. Um, I can tell you reasons about that if you want to know why later. Uh, but um, anyway... Yeah, I'd love to I know about that, that. Let's get into that next. Okay, so, um, so Star Wars world, if we don't have government imposition on our choices of money, I think it's going to be a diverse array of things that people find of value. And I think it's going to be things that actually represent labor and scarcity. And I don't think Bitcoin, even though it's scarce within its own blockchain, I don't think it's scarce when it comes to the blockchain world. Yeah, but I think Bitcoin's different too in that um, it actually requires... Um, a significant amount of electricity and energy and computing power to secure the network. So you need that. And so if you're actually investing real world electricity and computing power, I think that gives it value. Yeah, this is the another key point, which is the proof of work. You know, the consensus algorithm that they've come up with, uh, which runs off proof of work, that is the key that is the driver of the economics behind Bitcoin because it's more and more expensive to mine Bitcoin the more people competing to win the rewards. You've got um, basically the way that Bitcoin works is that each block is pointing back to the hash of the previous block so that there's a linear chain and if your transaction's in the next block you have to pay a fee and the, the people that are basically picking up those um, transactions in the mempool, they're only going to do so if they're incentivized to do so. So that's why if you put like uh, nothing as a fee, then you won't see your transaction 
be executed on the network because no one wants to do it. So that's also why um, there is some in, there's some value in the network there. And then you've got the economics at play, which is the halving of the rewards that occur um, at a set time. And then you've also got the property of it being um, limited in number. So those those combination of things is like the perfect storm. It's the first innovation like this that's ever existed in a permissionless way, in a peer-to-peer -peer thing that's voluntary. I think it is like a, a libertarian's wet dream, essentially. Um, the, I agree. I, this is missing one. The one part that shift keeps on going back to what I keep going back to is the par the parallel. It's not truly scarce because someone could duplicate. Like to me, this would be my example answer. Like to me, if let's imagine that Bitcoin um, was all it could be if it had the privacy now of Monero. Now it becomes more of a libertarian wet dream. Bitcoin, we hoped would be that at the time. That was the big deal about it. What is it now? Eight nine years ago. And uh, and now I just don't think it has the value we wished it would then. And I can't even imagine what the future is going to bring. Yeah, so this, but, this touches a point then, doesn't it? Can I, I jump think, in here? Yes, sir. Um, sure. But yeah. I want to ex expand on this later, which is privacy. So let's uh, go into your point, Kate, and then keep privacy in mind for later. Yeah, well, I think um, you keep mentioning that Bitcoin is going to have competitors. And of course, I think we both agree with that. But I think if you're a libertarian, you think that's a good thing. Oh, Bitcoin's yeah. got uh, compare, uh, you know, you know, uh, competition from Monero, from uh, Bitcoin Cash, Dash, uh, all these other coins that unless you're really into it, you've never even heard of them. But I think that competition is a good thing. And Bitcoin has made upgrades. And sometimes with controversies, we've got these forks. We've got the Bitcoin BTC BCH fork, and we had uh, Bitcoin Cash fork, fork into two different ones. And it hasn't killed either of the projects. So I think competition is a good thing. The networks will upgrade. And, you know, I'm not 100% sure it will be uh, Bitcoin that will be the dominant one. But I think you'll always have, like, you know, maybe three, four, five different cryptocurrencies that are popular. And you can trade in between them just like you can trade in between different fiat currencies. So I think, of course, Bitcoin is going to have competition. And maybe maybe someone will take it down, but it does have that network effect, that name recognition. You know, money is a viral product, like Pump said. So that would be my uh, argument against that. Also, to talk I, I about... I think you're right. Sorry. Everything you said was right. It's missing one part. Go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. Um, no, if you, if you don't mind, it's just about the privacy thing. So Monero, you picked up on, on that. You said that would be a libertarian's wet dream. And now, why is Monero not? It's because it's, uh, there's no limit on the supply, right? Monero is, Monero doesn't have a hard cap. The, the uh, emphasis was the privacy of Monero. If you just added that, that part to the Bitcoin yeah. network, the set component. It would be better, but I, I think that there'll be more than one step to the one that replaces Bitcoin. Where, and like I said, I think it's going to be some sort of other functionality in combination with the functionality of different blockchains. That is going to be the answer. And how it will look, that's really hard to predict, but it's going to be something along the lines of it has two things going on at once. And that's how every currency that has um, long-lasting stability has happened and thrived. And I just don't see history breaking in this case for tech sake because scarcity is always going to be the thing that makes things valuable. That's true. And what do you think about then uh, Bitcoin Cash? Because Bitcoin Cash is uh, on the tech side, tried to focus on scalability and use. And then also they've introduced um, some new things that I've discovered recently. I think, Cade, you mentioned this uh, on another podcast, Shuffling. maybe we haven't. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Coin yeah, they've got, and they've got a new update with um, Cash Fusion, which is going to be even um, more private, apparently. So, uh, yeah, I think those are really interesting use cases for sure. So that functionality you... with a scarce resource backing dispersed around the world. That's, I think, the eventual answer. And I think it will be multiple buckets. You're going to you might have a product like gold money. <laughs> I think is a good product in the sense, and I wanted to address that too. Gold money, if the merchant has a gold money account, you run the gold money credit card and it transfers the gold automatically. That's probably what he didn't address um, 
uh, and if you wanted cash, you could choose cash. Now, I, I suppose I don't know if the BitPay gives the option of depositing into a Bitcoin wallet or the immediate dollar or fiat currency payment. But that's one thing he was getting at. But the thing that's missing for the cryptocurrency versus the gold is the history. The only reason gold is not used day to day for money, uh, either with a IOU type voucher like the dollar used to be, is because the government made it so that it's taxed at each transaction if there's any change in value with the capital gain. So otherwise, gold would be money tomorrow. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what's hampering both Bitcoin and gold. I think we can agree with sure. that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think at yeah. the core of this, we agree that the government is an issue. <laughs> I think yes. that that's, that's yeah. why we, we like, um, you know, me and Cade, we like cryptocurrency, you like gold, but we all agree that, you know, too much government like is a bad thing yeah, in general. Well, it's funny. Though. It's, a, it's just basically uh, not a proper allocation of resources in a market. Yeah, uh, it's funny, actually, uh, just a little nugget tidbit here. Everyone's heard of the Boston Tea Party, and I was doing a little re reading recently, and apparently it had nothing to do with the tax. You know, it was pretty small, like 1% to 3%, but it was actually, they more they really rebelled because they weren't allowed to make and print their own money. So that was actually one of the primary reasons. It wasn't about 1.5% like, tea tax. And yeah, if the government got out of the way, I would love to see gold, silver, and Bitcoin com compete on the free market. And I think everyone would agree with that, on, at least in this group. Yes. Yeah, that's that's true. Now, when it comes to the price of gold, though, this is one thing that Pomp addressed in the debate. And uh, Peter Schiff said uh, about, you know, gold's increasing in value. It's gone up 40 times since we got off the gold standard or something like that. But then Kate was so generous about it. Actually, I'll tell you, I, I can address this really directly because I, I follow it. I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself a gold bug. I, I just think gold, the history of it is what yeah. I respect. It's only an economic thing to me. It's not a, an emotional thing to me at all. I, I really could care less about gold. I'm not a fan of like the aesthetic part of it or whatnot. Uh, but um, I would say that you mentioned uh, that it's going up in value even in spite of inflation, but really it's a marker of inflation if you look at the long chart of it. Of course, there's fluctuations within eras that make it profitable beyond the uh, devaluing of the American dollar. But really, you see cycles. If you have this a, a flat line drawn through the chart, you would see that it's really that the gold has the same purchasing power that it did then. Now, yeah. the, the time that gold is going to skyrocket, it's going to be relative to fiat. It might still have the buying power of what the dollar should be buying today. So I'm not saying that if you're looking to make a lot of money that you're going to uh, want to buy gold and do the day-to-day -day trading where you see the high fluctuations of cryptocurrency 2017. It's not going to happen. Could gold go to $10,000 easily in the next 10 years? Sure. Is it likely? Probably not. $3,000 in the next major recession? Very realistic. 5000 I would even say that's something I'd bet on. Uh, but um, 10,000 is impossible, but it's not necessarily because gold is suddenly this hot commodity. It's more about world currencies and people losing faith. And that also could be absorbed by cryptocurrency if people find that to be the most palatable product. Yeah, I agree with that as far as, yeah, you know, the going up in value, it is compared to gold. And I totally agree with that analysis. Um, one thing you talk about, and uh, Peter Schiff talks about a lot, is history. And I agree, I think we all agree that gold has had a good, great store of value over thousands of years. But I think that's one thing where you guys are going to be too harsh on Bitcoin is because it's in its infancy. You know, it is a new thing. So there are going to be hiccups in the beginning, but, you know... Over a long enough time scale, you know, maybe in 10, 15 years, people will see Bitcoin and crypto will be very commonplace. You know, you can go back and watch these old clips on YouTube of like the Today Show or whatever. And they're talking about the email. Why would you need email? You can just, you know, send a letter. You know, why do I need to advertise? Why do I need to have a website? And now that those questions seem silly. And I wonder if in 10 or 20 years, this will all flush itself out in the free market. It will, but the thing that I want to emphasize is I love this technology. It's just Bitcoin in particular or coins like it, including Monero, frankly, I just don't think those are going to be the winner in the marketplace. I think it's going to be something more like Ethereum, but with 
true scarcity like Bitcoin or the one that I know Josh has heard me talk about that well, a friend of mine in Korea turned me on to his ardor. But the, the idea that they have some sort of functionality, I think you'll see uh, services being provided, products being transferred, ledgers of things that we can't even imagine right now. Probably our lives could go on this network much like they have on the Internet. I am as hot as you are about blockchain. I'm not as hot as you are about uh, the things that have no secondary uh, functionality in our current economy, piggybacking on it to give it an additional layer of value. I just think that things will be able to be dispersed so so tremendously all over the world that if everything went so bad, like the meteor hitting the earth kind of thing is what would uh, be destroying these dispersed assets much like they would if Bitcoin happened to be the winner. I think that um, you'll have gold scattered so many places that the diversification of risk will be well worth it to have that extra asset value. Yeah, well, I think we all agree that blockchain is an amazing technology. I think that's one point we all three agree on is that it'll have other use cases, putting assets on the blockchain, inventory tracking, security, even doing legal stuff like putting wills and smart contracts on the blockchain. Um, Josh, do you have any takeaway or any questions or? Yeah, one of the things, um, you know, that we haven't really defined and it's hard to define, so it's fair enough, is the time scale. So there's a, a popular blog, I'm sure you've all read it, zerohedge.com, you know that one, you know, on a, yeah. on, a, on a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone drops to zero and that's the same for everything, right? So it's easy to say that eventually everything will be replaced by something else. That's fair. But I don't think in the next 10 years we're going to see Bitcoin going anywhere near zero. So I would take you up on that bet, Matthew, about the gold versus the Bitcoin thing. And I do want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, which is you were first aware of Bitcoin when it was four cents. Yes. And you sold the Bitcoin that you'd acquired later on. You probably didn't get it at four cents. Probably. I didn't buy it then. I, I tried to acquire $100 worth at four cents. But because I am not oh, the yeah. most tech savvy individual, I never was able to obtain it. Um, I, did, um, I did get invested right around the time I had met you. So if you can figure that time scale out. And um, I did do very well in the marketplace because I was able to time the market and get out in December 2017 telling everyone that it's going to go down. Um, and, and there's, a, I think, a one key reason on the American side, and I'm curious if Kate can pick up on it, that happened in 2017 that affected him, I imagine, and certainly affected me, that made me want to get out in addition to what I was seeing in the charts. Uh, but um, for well, the I'm, tax code changed. Anyway, uh, okay. What, I, what I'm saying is that you, uh, I, I, did, I didn't... Um, I didn't know that uh, exactly when you bought it. Or I know that you're interested in it. I remember we met in Daegu and we had a few beers one night and uh, we talked about it a little bit. Um, I think in 2016 or 17, I can't remember exactly when that was. Um, I think it was end of 2016 is my recollection. Okay. And then, yeah, so we've, anyway, but what, what I want to say is, I'll go back to it, is like you were around when it, you saw it being sold at four cents. And yes. you, you witnessed it go up to 20K. So yes. you know that there is um, a lot of interest in it. And you know Absolutely. that, you know, do you think that the it will never reach 20K again? Because I think it's going to reach like 80, 86K next year. I, I heard your predictions. I've listened to all the episodes and I love the show. Um, I, I, I do think that it will be worth less than gold in 10 years if I had to bet. Yeah. If I put a probability on it, I'd say... 80% probability. It, the, the thing that I, I want to emphasize is here, you're right that there's power in the things you said with Bitcoin, and a lot of it is psychological. Mm -hmm. I think the, the reason I think it's going to go down, the thing that's going to wake people up, is it's a better product. I think there will be a Facebook to the MySpace kind of revolution, uh, something that takes it more global, like Google took Yahoo and Alta Vista and all these things. But there's going to be something that emerges, and I think it might be something uh, that's many pieces to the pie. Uh, something like Ethereum is trying to do in one platform. I think there'll be many platforms that operate many aspects of whatever our life is at that time. Everything that we're doing now online, I could see having some sort of blockchain functionality. I think gold will probably be, before 10 years is over, over five, and I think Bitcoin will be under five. I think yeah, it'll probably be under one. Well, I think, 
I think um, it's pretty interesting. I like gold. I like crypto. I like betting, and I like the blockchain technology. So, if you guys want to make it happen, we should make a smart contract with sure. uh, one of the blockchains, and you guys can lock up whatever amount you want, and uh, it will be automatically cool. be dispersed with the oracles. That would be kind of fun. If we could give it a public address, and we could everyone could see it. That's that's one other cool thing is you can make yeah. uh, bets on the blockchain. That's cool. That is- Actually. Yeah, I, I, Ardor has all this functionality for voting and and contracts and whatnot, and uh, they were already ready for live action when 2017 came around, when Ethereum is still not ready for prime time. Ardor was just sitting there waiting, but it's all about publicity and the ideas, like you said, too. I just think that Bitcoin got the pub, and there's going to be another thing that catches fire that we can't even anticipate yet. When I mention Libra, I want to make it very clear. I don't think Libra is a good product. I just think that there's going to be something coming where there's buzz like Libra got that is going to catch on where people actually truly buy in and it can't be seen. Yeah, hey guys, be- I want to say something crazy. The only thing that I think could happen to like dethrone Bitcoin is if a big government player like the United States decided to just throw their weight behind blockchain technology and put the US dollar on the blockchain and basically say, look, it's legal tender. Go back to a similar standard that they had before pre Bretton Woods. Some, um, something you could trade in, I don't know, it might be even gold. It could be like a gold-backed digital crypto um, uh, fiat currency, but not fiat, just backed by gold and on the blockchain. Like imagine if the US dollar did that. Already. Uh, that's actually something I can tell you. Like the, the central banks are buying up their gold and they're bringing their gold back home. They're looking already at this problem. I think the governments are way on top of this. I have little doubt that Facebook has some coordination with people in the government. Um, I think that they're going to try to capture it. And you guys address this too in your podcast. The government is going to try to capture this. They're not going to try to stop it because they can't. They're going to try to hitch a ride and they're going to try to capture the marketplace. They they do not want gold. Uh, But But, they might. I I was um, going along the lines of... um, let's say the government decides to make itself smaller, the right people fall into place and they just decide to disband all of the uh, rent seekers, the swamp is drained and we live in a utopian world where, you know, the government has gone back to its complete minimal basics, which is defending the homeland, looking after uh, the people of the nation and like being very limited in its actions beyond that. That's the only foreseeable thing that I can, uh, and that's like a one in a million that I think could ever like usurp the uh, the power of Bitcoin. Yeah, I don't think that's. Yeah, I think you're right. One in a million is about the right uh, percentage because yeah, it would be great if they did that. It was you know asset backed or not asset backed. If it was a stable supply, but governments love being able to print money at will, so. Um, yeah, I'm with Josh there. I don't think anything, I don't see anything stopping Bitcoin. What, what, I, what I was getting at is that I think that it's a matter of time until there's confidence lost in governments generally when it comes to money. So I think that actually that would be a matter of time, not if, when. Uh, so will it be our current power brokers? No. It's mm-hmm. when when everything hits the fan, that's when it emerges. When everything hits the fan, it's, it'll be good to have gold and crypto. And I know, uh, I don't think uh, you sold most of your crypto or almost all of it. I'm curious if it does go I down. Think, like 99% of it. And now Sorry. I have maybe a few more percent, few okay. more percent back. Okay. So if it does go down to 3000 or 5000 are you buying the dip or are you never getting back in? Are you going to sell some gold to buy crypto or put some fiat into crypto or are you just done with it? I'm not I'm not done with crypto. I'm just I I don't have faith long term in Bitcoin, but I wrote a lot of waves that I didn't believe in either. This is because I the animal spirits, so to speak, is what I call them. But I think there were things to ride and you wanted to make money, but you're taking a gamble. I felt fairly confident that I could read charts and and um, you could buy the rumor, sell the fact kind of things. Um, a lot of people knew a lot more than I did that really helped me. But when it came to getting out, I knew that the the tax laws in the United States were really going to be a burden. And and honestly, if the government ever catches up with people, there's going to be a lot of people that are in big trouble because of the capital gains taxes required after 2017. I think a lot of big players who knew what they were doing 
they dumped in 2017 at that moment because they knew they're going to suddenly have to pay a huge capital gain. And if it went down, they're going to be on the hook for the gain, even with the loss. Um, and that's really something that changed the marketplace. And uh, also, you, when you see this exponential growth, we had that run up there, that latter part of 2017, that looked like our housing market times seven. So, yeah, it was a, it was bound to have a correction at minimum, whether you are right or I am right on the long term projection of Bitcoin with crypto, there had to be a correction, more steady growth. If it's going to actually be currency, you're not going to have rapid growth or it won't be a currency and people are going to lose interest to some degree, like Peter was saying, when they don't think they can uh, buy the Lambo with their profits and have that huge ride up, there's going to be some sort of um, drop off at that point, too. Yeah, well, I think that's one issue that, um, yeah, if you want to use it as a uh, currency, yeah, the volatility is an issue. But on the other hand, it's not volatile when you can ver- can compare it to the Venezuelan Boulevard and some of these other wild fiat currencies. But yeah, that is an issue. Um, I think if it's if it's not going to have such extreme peaks and valleys, if it's just kind of gradually going up and it's not having these crazy parabolic swings up and down, um, that the market will price that in. You know, if it's going up in value, if you want to purchase some goods, maybe the vendor will give you a 10, 15, 20 percent discount. So I think right. in some ways that stuff can be priced in. But, yeah, if it's completely volatile like crazy, um, people are hesitant to to use it to buy stuff and people are hesitant to accept it. That's true. Absolutely. All right. So Josh, do you have anything you want to talk about or, or Matt, you want to go ahead? Uh, I just wanted to say that I, I think I've gotten my general points across. So really, I don't think we're terribly far apart. There's a, a key focal point that I think we disagree, but it's, it's more about we're going to have to see who is right in the uh, world of ideas in the marketplace of what people command. And also there's a variable of we don't know what the marketplace is marketplace is going to bring to bear i don't know what that product could be that could totally uh change things and i guess none of us do um i just have a feeling that we'll see that tie to another factor and and you you guys definitely have some value in this uh this thing that is not tangible being value and and i can see something to that i just think there will be a new way to further diversify and disperse the risk into um our economy on a broader scale that will just be a step up and will stick. It's interesting what, our discussion, what we've had. And I think uh, for me, the takeaway is it's all about the timeline or the time frame, because I can agree with you when you're looking at the, like the macro picture, I think that you are right. And in the end, it's going to be that way. However, um, to get to that point, and I'm not, uh, saying that it will be gold and neither did you that will be the, the you know the winner it might be a, a, a more advanced blockchain technology it might not even be a blockchain it could be a DAG or something like that but some technology that enables um you know free trade in in the new world that we're living in yeah i think that i can see that yeah. but one of the things um is that in the short term let's say the next 10 years i can't see a future where enough people have become informed to reach the point that is required to get to the paradigm shifts that are required in your scenario because it takes a massive shift in the way that people think about money and finance in order for them to um, go through what has taken us years to comprehend and like self-educate and all that stuff. And I just don't think that the average consumer is ready for that when most people are watching soaps, reality TV, sports, dramas, TV shopping channels, getting delivery pizzas, um, and not really thinking too deeply about very much. I just think we're so far away from where you want it to be or where you see it going that it will take a lot longer in the time frame so that's where the time frame thing comes in i do agree with you in the long run but i think we're looking at like more than 50 years yeah i mean i mean we're that. we're all crypto ogs here but even in 2019 you're an early adopter i would still say 90 percent of the people don't know what bitcoin is and a lot of people have still never even heard of it so if it is the greater fool fallacy which i don't think it is it's not going to take effect until like the year 2120 or something when, when all the Bitcoin's been mined. I just don't see it happening anytime soon either. I'm more bullish on uh, 
the adaption part. I think that think about internet and like the AOL days when you had the AOL CD come in the mail until now. I think that we're at a faster rate now. So maybe you size that in half, for example. When you talk about this, the blockchain technology being implemented over time, I think you're going to see a curve where it's suddenly going to be implemented very rapidly at the end of that curve. And then when it comes to the actual products, they're going to be built on. So you're going to start to see like the Uber, Airbnb type things on the blockchain. And those were in place very quickly. And I think our time curve is going down historically. So I could imagine the 10 year thing, I have a harder push. But in 20, let's say 10, I think you'll see that turnover where you're going to a different paradigm. And then it will be more refined and evolved like we are now with the internet by 20. Yeah, it's curious. 20 years from now, that would be 2039. I'll, I'm curious to see what, I'm very curious to see what the price would be in 20 years. Um, one other point I kind of want to make about um, crypto, Bitcoin, and other cryptos in general um, is I think maybe you or Peter Schiff mentioned that gold's aesthetically pleasing. I don't think I disagree with that. But for me, I think Bitcoin is aesthetically pleasing and it's just so cool you know on my phone here i have a wallet and it could have a dollar ten dollars a hundred dollars a thousand dollars a million dollars ten million dollars a hundred million dollars i could have it on this phone and send it anywhere in the world but visa mastercard paypal no one can stop me and i just think that's so cool it's so interesting it's so revolutionary and I still think a lot of people don't get that. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Maybe not aesthetically pleasing, but it's a nice sensation. <laughs> the aesthetic of putting my phone and just yeah. hitting swipe and sending it anywhere in the world. Yeah, the application has got some nice user experience, that's true. But I'll that's tell you what, the, you that's feel not the better. Blockchain. <laughs> I agree with you, first of all. But I, I have on my, my phone, for example, I have crypto, but I also have the the gold money, for example, I like the idea that I could put gold on a blockchain and send it or buy uh, one share of Abbott stock. Uh, I would like to send that over the blockchain. OK, and so I think that makes me more excited. It's like a double thrill for me personally. Um, so I, I, I think that that's where the future is headed, like the transactional power of Bitcoin with the uh functionality of everything that's going on our whole economy will be put on the blockchain and we'll actually have something that is not stoppable um that's very exciting to me because government can't stop being airbnb or uber or all these things really and things are getting more decentralized even our in our centralization of governments in many places you see de decentralization online and it becomes even easier and more transparent on the blockchain i think you're going to see something where basically the economy gets put in that network completely and you'll get to choose your assets, your functionality, your whatever it is. Yeah, that's interesting. I was just curious. Um, you have the gold money account. Um, I'm curious, do you actually use it to buy stuff or are you more of a hodler of gold? Do you ever use your gold money account to buy stuff at a store or get gas or anything like that? Uh, I, I, I am a, a hodler of gold now because I expect gold to spike in our next recession, which to be frank, I, I predicted would happen sooner just because um, if anyone's familiar, we're on right now the longest cycle post-depression uh, without a recession. And um, I think it's because we had slow growth in the Obama era. I think that Trump ha has actually, by doing good, uh, sped up the cycle because things are growing so rapidly. And unfortunately, he was handed up bad set of cards by Obama and the Federal Reserve policy that was just continued as it has been since 1913, really. So... Uh, unfortunately, there is going to be a correction, and it's a matter of how big is this one going to be to me, and what timing is it going to happen? Um, the probability says it should have been already done by now because this is now the longest. So um, I expect gold to spike. I, I, I could see Bitcoin even spiking, but I think long term people are going to flight uh, to something that has some comfort to them. Yeah, well, I, I think. Um... People that are into gold and crypto both agree. People are leaving the S&P 500, getting out of stocks and bonds. They're fleeing into gold, uh, platinum, crypto. And yeah, when the recession hits, you should have some of those things. Or in my opinion, maybe you should have all of those things. Gold is uh, up $200 in the last month or two. Uh, that's yeah. quite a lot. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Um, yeah, well, I, I really enjoyed talking to you today, Matt. Um, 
Well, I also enjoyed it too because it seems like maybe Peter Schiff just isn't that good of a debater or he doesn't understand the tech as as much, but it seems like you know more about um, the blockchain. It seemed like to me like I'm, we covered it in the previous episode, but he was talking about spoofing volume on the Bitcoin chain, which isn't possible. He was talk. He made a couple other few gaffes, but um, it was really interesting talking. Dumping in the market at that time. Just to add one quick point, I think that he was talking about the whales manipulating the market, and I think we saw that happen in 2017. Okay, where people dump, and then they, there'd be a trend down, and, and maybe they'd buy the people who were freaking out, and then they'd spike back up, and they'd do the same thing over and over again. Yeah, well, Just whales. The problem with his 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 debate was there was no background content. I know his background content because I listen to it regularly. Yeah, well, I, if the whales dump, that's not spoofing it. They're actually selling it and then they're buying it, which is like, you know, kind of being a bully whale, but it's not spoofing it. But, uh, but he, yeah, he, he, just right, and add, he was wrong. To point I just know his line of thinking. That's what I, um, I think I feel. You know, like the, you couldn't do that with gold. You couldn't just dump your gold on the market that, and then rebuy it again. That would be illegal, right? Correct. Well, I think so, well, well, the thing here's, is, a, you could, here's the thing. You can do it with Bitcoin and we're libertarians. So do we want the go do we want the government telling us what to do? You know, that's yeah, a, that's absolutely a not. bit. And, so and also, should and we also, be able to, you know, manipulate the markets? That's what capitalism is. If you look going back to the Rothschilds, how they made a fortune. If you even look at recent times like George Soros, when he nearly broke the Bank of England in the early 90s that type of stuff. Um, I think that, you know, it is right that um, people can do it. You, that's the part of the capitalist system that you have to em embrace. And actually, one of the things I was thinking about uh, listening to our discussion or reflecting on it as we were doing it is um, I wonder if someone just tuned in midway through our discussion and what they would think about us. You know, they would say that, aren't we terrible? Uh, we're terrible people. We believe in money and and holding wealth and stuff like that. And I think that um, the one thing that we all share is the reason we got into this. Uh, not only gold and cryptocurrency, but it's the underlying philosophy, which is freedom. And I think we've got to um, maybe spell that out a little bit more in some of the future episodes about why it is that um, it's so important to have you know self. Um, self uh, independence and liberty because I think that's something we all share that is spot on yeah definitely well the one thing about dumping gold and rebuying it is it's you really can't do that though because it's such a mature market and there's not little tiny gold exchanges it's like a global thing so I don't know if that would be quite as possible but yeah I think that's a great um, place to uh, end the show um, I don't really have any other thoughts but uh, Josh do you want to do some closing comments and we'll let uh, Matt finish up? Yeah, sure. I'd say thanks for coming on the show, Matthew. It's been a great episode. I think we've got into a lot of different stuff. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, I think the uh, audience will uh, have enjoyed this one. We really got into a lot of uh, different things. Write your comments below and um, we'll pick them up. And thanks for coming on. And please, uh, you know, let us know more about your company if people want to know about that, like let them know how to find out about it. Well, first of all, it has been a pleasure. I really enjoy this kind of thing, and uh, your show is great, and I enjoy listening to it. Uh, for me, my, the thing that I've started, uh, the Practical Education Institute, is an extension on things I've done in the past. I'm, going, I'm working on my doctorate, uh, educational doctorate in leadership, and I'm trying to develop ideas by this institute and uh, while trying to make some money doing projects and implementing and testing out my products. So practicaleducationinstitute.com. I, I always welcome anyone that's uh, posting in groups on Facebook and whatnot. Just like hearing people's thoughts on different topics, just like you guys do on your show every week. All right. Well, that will do it for the three of us this week. And we will see you next week on the dark side of the hollow moon.
Hoddle Moon!